morning. It's Sunday, February 27. We are concluding our series of reflections on the Beatitudes. We began eight weeks ago, taking our time as we consider these eight ancient blessings that Jesus spoke centuries ago that continue to shape our lives today in the sense that they enable us to understand what the presence of the kingdom of heaven looks like, even in our world still today. As we've made our way through these Beatitudes, we've perhaps had a clearer picture of what the kingdom of heaven looks like, what it means for us to belong to the kingdom of heaven already now. We are going to certainly see that again this morning. But as we've made our way through these Beatitudes, I'm sure we've had a sense of how the kingdom of heaven's values are very different from the values that we see in the world around us. The kingdom of heaven is particularly poised to bring blessing to those who are most vulnerable, least important, and often forgotten according to the ways of the world. And that's what makes these blessings so meaningful for so many, including us still today. We know what it is like to experience difficulty and hardship in life, and yet these are ex exactly the, the situations, the contexts into which these Beatitudes bring the blessings of the kingdom. Many times people think in the world around us that in order to experience true joy and happiness, real blessing if you want to use that word, you need to feel successful. You have to be accomplished. You have to have a life that is uncomplicated. And these Beatitudes are showing us that real blessing, real joy, real purpose is often experienced in contexts that are very different than these. I'd like to begin this message by reading again something that uh, I shared in the first message on the Beatitudes. Words that I found in a sermon on the Beatitudes that I think really clarify what all of these blessings are like and how especially appropriate they are for people, including ourselves, when we experience hardship and heartbreak. And so these uh, words that are found in this sermon that I found really help us understand who Jesus is and what his love is like in the world still today. The pastor says this, these Beatitudes are assuring us that it is precisely at those most devastating and vulnerable, secret, difficult, and stumbling moments of our lives that we are closest to the kingdom of God. The staggering truth of God's kingdom is that it is right here and right now. It's closest to us when we feel farthest from it. It is the kingdom of failures, sinners, and strugglers. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, not someday, but right now. This means that we are closest to Jesus and to the kingdom of heaven that he brings when we keep in touch with our weaknesses, our most vulnerable feelings, our deepest failures, and our haunting fears. We'll see that again this morning as we reflect on the final beatitude recorded in Matthew 5, verse 10, and then verses 11 and 12 also provide some uh, extended commentary on what it means to experience blessing in times of persecution. And then I'll also read some verses from 1 Peter chapter 3, 4, and 5 that really flesh that out for us. But let's begin by hearing these words in Matthew 5, verses 10, 11, and 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then these words from 1 Peter. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 
Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. Incredible words. And I'd like to think with you a little bit about what it means to experience the blessing of persecution. It's not something that many of us perhaps have experienced, certainly not like many Christians throughout history and in the world today experience. But we all experience something, I think, of what it means to face opposition or hardship precisely because we are Christians. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. And it's interesting that we find the reference to the kingdom of heaven twice in these, in these Beatitudes. First, in the very first Beatitude, and then here in the final Beatitude. So the blessing of the kingdom of heaven is kind of like bookends in these blessings. It encompasses all of the blessings of these Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now here in the final Beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. I want to just reflect briefly with you on what the kingdom of heaven really means. Because sometimes we have different thoughts or opinions about that. We might think that heaven, for instance, speaks primarily or even exclusively um, to a, a, a future reality. Heaven is where we go after we die. That's the kingdom of heaven. And certainly that's true. In fact, Jesus even refers in this beatitude to the promise of a reward in heaven. Great will be your reward. So heaven is definitely a future reality, but only in as much as the fullness of heaven or the kingdom of heaven comes in a future moment. But the kingdom of heaven, according to the Bible, is here and now. It's already here. And so the blessing of this beatitude is that we know we are already now citizens of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Now this says something incredible about how these beatitudes bring blessing to us today. The reign of God, that's really what the kingdom of heaven is all about. The power, grace, glory, majesty, love of God, that kingdom is present in the world today and we're a part of it in that we already are citizens of that and we enable that kingdom to become an even greater reality in our world today. I like the way N.T. Wright, who has written a lot about the kingdom of heaven and what that means, I like the way he, he puts it when he talks about heaven not as being some future reality but a present already, now reality. He says in his book, Surprised by Hope, the New Testament speaks of heaven not as our going to be where Jesus is, but of his coming to, bear, to be where we are. Not some future reality to go to be with Jesus after we die, but a present reality where Jesus comes to be with us already here in all of our hardship and struggle primarily. And so I'm thinking especially about how persecution is something that obviously makes people's lives very complicated. It upsets them. People suffer horribly as the result of persecution. They lose their lives often as martyrs. And it's very interesting that the word martyr literally means witness. When Jesus spoke to his disciples just before ascending to be in heaven with his father in the book of Acts chapter 1, we read about this. 
He says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses, beginning here in Jerusalem and expanding to cover the entire earth. And the word witness is literally the same word for martyr. That's the Greek word, martyr. And history has recorded countless examples of martyrdom. Still today in the world, there are Christians who die simply because they belong to Jesus Christ. They bear that name. To be a witness is to be a martyr. And many Christians experience martyrdom in that most profound sense. This is what makes the kingdom of heaven an already now present reality. In the context of persecution and incredible suffering, the grace, power, love, and glory of God is evident. I think of how so many Christians in the context of persecution also see the kingdom of heaven expand there in that place. Again, Christian history has so many examples that verify this. Christian witness is the very thing that enables the Church of Christ, the Kingdom of Heaven, to advance, even in the context of persecution. And so, as one of the ancient Church Fathers put it, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the Church. In other words, the very contexts where Christianity experiences the greatest opposition and persecution is often the place where Christianity thrives. And that's also why Peter, in his words that I read to, with you, emphasizes how facing persecution, the fiery ordeal that we are under where, because of the, the devil, like a roaring lion on the prowl seeking people to devour, how we handle that as Christians is of, of utmost significance. And the way Christians bear witness to the power and love of Christ in that context is an incredible opportunity for the kingdom of heaven to, to expand and grow. Largely, of course, because Jesus himself experienced incredible suffering, persecution, if you want to call it that. The most traumatic experience of, of martyrdom is his example of suffering and dying on the cross for us. And so Christians who face that same kind of suffering, and Peter describes that too, that we, we participate in the sufferings of Jesus, following his example of suffering, but also the example of hope and grace and strength and triumph. When I was in the seventh grade, I remember reading a book that captivated me. In fact, I think it's the first book that I've read that, uh, that really touched my heart. It's a book written by Richard Wormbrandt, who himself was someone who experienced incredible opposition and persecution in communist Romania, and then went on to uh, found an organization that really helped bring attention to the martyrdom, the suffering of Christians all over the world. This book was called In God's Underground. And the part of that book that really captivated me is when he tells the story of how he was in a prison camp, specifically because he was a Christian, and he was housed in this camp with others, Christians, who were being persecuted for their faith. And his bed was between two individuals. One of them was an old Catholic priest, and the young man beside him on the other side was a young man named Vasilescu. He was a former communist guard, who in fact was a former guard in that very prison camp. He had fallen out of the graces of his superiors, and now he's here, numbered among all the others who are suffering in this camp. And the part of this book, In God's Underground, that really tugged at my heart is recorded when uh, Wormbrand describes how Vasilescu, himself a young man but yet dying, on his deathbed in the camp, was overcome with, with a sense of guilt and, and shame and deep, profound regret for everything that he had done. Father uh, Abbot Iskew, who was the old priest on the other side of Richard Wormbrand, was himself one that Vasilescu had tortured, treated incredibly cruelly. And in the book, In God's Underground, Wormbrand describes how Vasilescu, in his dying moments, was overwhelmed with sorrow and could find no peace. He prayed, asking for mercy, and asked for, for Richard Wormbrandt to come and, and bring him peace. The old priest, Abbot Iskew, too weak himself to get up, commanded other camp residents to pick him up and carry him to Vasilescu's bed. 
The abbot sat beside the young man who had tortured him, Wormbrand writes, and he put a gentle hand on his arm. Be calm, he said soothingly. You are young. You hardly knew what you were doing. He wiped sweat from the boy's forehead with a rag. I forgive you with all my heart, he said, and so would other Christians too. And if we forgive, surely Christ, who is better than us, will forgive your sin. There is a place in heaven for you also. He received Vasilescu's confession and gave him communion before being carried back to his bed. During the night, Wormbrand writes, both the abbot and Vasilescu died. I believe they walked hand in hand to heaven. It's a poignant, powerful scene. And I think it's true that the abbot and Vasilescu did walk hand in hand to heaven. There is a future reality, a future reward that this beatitude speaks of. But before they walked hand in hand to heaven, heaven came to them. Jesus came to them. The kingdom of heaven came to them. Enemies became friends. And they did go hand in hand to heaven, but only because already here in this earth, there was a little colony of heaven present in that horrific camp. The kingdom of heaven is not just future, it is here and now, very often in the context of suffering. Which is why Peter encourages Christians who are facing the fire of persecution to be strong, to have hope, to know that God cares for them and will lead them out of the suffering they are experiencing. It's what Peter wanted first-generation Christians to understand. Peter himself experienced this kind of ordeal, put in Herod's prison. We read about this in Acts chapter 12, where James, the brother of John, is killed. Peter certainly would have been killed as well, were it not for a miraculous escape from prison that we read about in Acts chapter 12. So Peter knows of what he writes, of how persecution and hardship for the sake of Christ comes to people. And when it does, the important thing is to conduct yourself as a Christian who follows the example of Christ with gentleness, with respect, with no sense of retaliation or vengeance, trusting God and knowing that God can use even those horrific situations to enable the kingdom of heaven to advance more and more here on earth. I think Peter probably had this eighth beatitude in mind when he writes the words that I read to you earlier, 1 Peter 3, verse 14. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. The words for what is right is literally one word in Greek, righteousness, the same word that Jesus uses in the beatitude. So there we have again the pairing of righteousness and persecution, righteousness and blessing. This confirms that how, uh, Peter, who heard this beatitude of Jesus, is now applying it as a pastor preaching a sermon to first-generation Christians in the middle of the fire of persecution. If you suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Maybe we will never experience the intensity of that kind of persecution that so many others have and are currently facing, but know that in all of your struggle and hardship, you are blessed because Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, has come to you. And with that, peace, confidence, trust, the care of God who will lift you up and lead you out. I hope you've enjoyed these reflections on the Beatitudes. I hope you've, exper hope you've experienced the blessing of the kingdom of heaven being brought into the places that you occupy, no matter how hard or disappointing they may be. I hope you know that because Jesus has come to you, you can be a person of hope and of incredible blessing. I hope that as you have heard these Beatitudes, you have experienced the peace and joy, the blessing of the kingdom of heaven. Thanks so much for watching this message. I look forward to sharing more messages with you in the future. Be well.